Welcome to the podcast. This is Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, the show where we watch the HBO show Watchmen. I'm Scott. And I'm Sam. And today we are going to be talking about season one, episode three, which is uh, she was killed by space junk. Space junk. Space almost junk. How- killed, guys. Almost. 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 <laughs> almost. That's my bad. I don't have the title in front of me because I wrote an outline without a title on it because that's the smartest <laughs> thing in the world. I'm sure my English professors will all be rolling over in there. They're not dead and we'll find out later. Uh, <laughs> not rolling over at all. Uh, Sam, why don't you tell the good people that have decided to, to join us today where they can find us if not on this YouTube channel or wherever they found us. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for, um, you know, following us these past few episodes so far. We definitely thank you guys for that. Definitely uh, appreciate your new um, subscribers coming. So for all these new users, make sure that you keep subscribing to our YouTube page. Make sure that you're following us at Nerdcyclopedia all over social media, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram. We are all over that. Um, make sure that you are leaving us some feedback at watching Watchmen at NerdCyclopedia.com. Or in the comments right here. You can just go right in the comments and just type that Down we're terrible. <laughs> and you'd rather us, you know, drive our cars into one of the many rivers in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, you can do that too. So feel free to drop us a line. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, some feedback. Uh, crazy theories you got. We're talking about if we get some feedback doing a little bit spoilery edition. We go into a little more detail, more speculation. More speculation. Um, if you're listening to this in your car on your commute and everything, we definitely appreciate you for that. You know, a lot of and we promise not to that. drop in traffic noises into the cast. No, we're <laughs> no, not going to no, put no any loud horns sense. or anything yeah. like that. You got to look we around. Care about your safety. We care about your safety here at uh, at uh, Nerd Cyclopedia Transcontinental <laughs> we, Enterprise. We want you watching the road. Okay? That's right. And then later on, watching Watchmen. There you go. With us. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so So without further ado, and, you know, we're going to go through this scene by scene. We're going to recap everything for you like we do on this. Um, I think before we get into the item by item recap, um, I want to say a couple, just a couple things generally here um, about about the episode and some of the world building that's done. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that uh, Jean Smart is excellent. She came in kicking some. (sighs) She is Throwing Excellent. some uh, Lori Blake is 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 the Lori Blake I wanted yeah. to, to see right. uh, that I've always wanted to see. She has Gene Smart has it been able to to you can see um, why the comedian was called the comedian when she portrays Lori Blake. Like that's how good she's doing. She's embodying that character to that degree where you can right. see like pedigree. Right. Uh, you, you so can see, you can so, see you can see that okay. When we talked about her and the um the character in the book mm-hmm. and how her progression was and everything up until this point of how she, how Jean Smart you know um portrays her and directs her and what we found out in the Pedia files about her taking on the persona of her dad yes you know um and just taking on that and everything her progression and her growth has just it's just, it's just uh, it's it's real it's it's been gone exponentially basically. This is a character that's it's uh, very complicated. Yes. Um, definitely not you know a one truck pony. Um, she's she's been able to. A lot. She has. She has. She's able to convey danger, uh, capability, world weariness, humor, and and sensuality. I'm just gonna say it like that because this was <laughs> an obscenely horny episode of television. It just really, really was. The, the yes. big blue. The big blue. Give me big blue. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, you know. And, and 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 I just wanted to say that that performance was. I, I feel like I've been kind of waiting for yeah for Gene Smart's Lori Blake to show yeah, up right. ever since I read this comic book like right. twenty years ago. Right, right. Uh, so I wanted to call out specifically that performance <laughs> as being something that was uh, is, is really something, really really something. And you know, it's a really great thing too because this is something that Damon does. It seems like in his shows. He um mm-hmm. he gets you hooked on a character. You know how characters start. You know some series start with a character, and you fall in love with the character, and you expect everything to just flow on in with with that character throughout the whole series. Damon loves doing this. You know he introduces us with Angela. You know, yep. and then the third episode, instead of actually featuring your main character, you start off with a whole nother character that we don't know and pray that the audience loves you know <laughs> takes to this character and sure yeah. enough gene smart came in just banging she 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 came in doing her thing she'd be like a breath of fresh air if uh you know angela abar wasn't already such a oh, breath man. of fresh air right 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 these, these are two 
uh, this could very have been compelling. Her show. Two very compelling, uh, very <clears throat> formidable, very well acted female roles. Yes. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent. We, you know, if, if you think about representation in media, you know, this is the type of heroine that you can really you can see why people like Captain Marvel. Um, you know, this this that that type of character, right. and I'm here for it. I'm just yeah. gonna say it like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about time, you know. Me too, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> well, Get I mean, and and, and 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 we'll Little talk silly. more later, you know, with our special guests and everything. Um, for the for the longest oh, wow. time. <laughs> for we the didn't long... even talk about our special guests. Uh, wow, wow. <laughs> well, go ahead. I'll let you do the um introduction. All right. So look, I. I... <laughs> I forgot to talk about a special guest. So uh, <coughs> Dr. Jeremy Lawrence from West Liberty University is going to join us for a chat. Uh, we talked to him, um, I mean, you know, through the power of magic earlier today. Magic. Uh, although it's later for you, it's earlier for us. Uh, really great conversation. You know, one of his uh, areas of study is comic book studies. So we talked to him about the medium and his relationship with Watchmen. You know, uh, one thing that he says that's really interesting, and I think you'll you'll find this perspective interesting uh, for our, our, our listeners, our watchers, our viewers, um, is that he kind of came to Watchmen as – an academic professional not as a fan or not as someone younger um so his perspective on the source material and the overarching themes of um you know the archetypal sort of non-powered superheroes is super interesting it's one of the reasons we had him on i i, I think you guys are just gonna love this yeah, you, conversation you, you, it's so you, interesting you're definitely gonna and a point i was trying to make earlier about females and um you know history of this medium and everything um you know for the longest time it was dominated by males you know and then gradually over the years females started coming into the whole thing so we talked with him about that and his his response or his um perspective on what he feels um on that development you know as far as that and them coming into Watchmen. <laughs> yeah so so again another that's two in a row a really good guess um so check out our previous videos if you don't believe that uh, <laughs> but that's the, wow, but that's we'll give we you really, the business if you don't believe that. <laughs> you don't even know how much I like giving people the business. It's one of the things I like to do the most <clears> in the world. <throat> it's the only thing I like to do in the world. All okay, right. okay. So, so that's enough preamble. Right. Um, most people already tuned let's, out let's, anyway. Let's, let's dig into this episode here. All right. So this this episode, episode three, it's going to do a lot of world building. There's going to be a lot of filling in the gaps. Um, uh, so let's just get started. So the Watchman, the Watchman title pops up this time on a dial tone. Yes. So we have uh, a silent movie, typewriter, dial tone. So that that in that order, and we're introduced to the framing device, uh, and that is Lori Blake is going to tell Doctor Manhattan a joke through the True Satellite Orbital Array. True is not T R U E. It is the name of a character that we'll I'm sure see later. Yep. And uh, apparently, people can send messages to Doctor Manhattan like prayers. I guess is kind of so, kind of what so, I'm getting, right. Yeah, yeah. So these things are all over the. Um, is or are, are they just on the in the U.S. or are they just all over like you know all over the world? That's <clears throat> that's something I'm curious about. You know, this thing's in Tulsa, and you know, at a certain point, you know, we find out that like Tulsa's big blue you know, phone phone booth, big blue phone booth. Yeah, uh -huh. big blue phone booth. You can call Doctor Manhattan on Mars. Uh, Tulsa's an outlier, weird place because they get the squid rain. Yeah. Um, uh, the Millennium Clock is there. We'll see that. There's yeah. something weird about Tulsa that's, you know, I, I don't want to. I'm not denigrating the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I say this. Mm -hmm. But if you <laughs> ask me to rank the cities in Oklahoma, I would probably put Oklahoma City at number one, <laughs> and specifically Edmond, and people know why that is. Um, <laughs> but Tulsa, just okay. Stillwater's pretty. <laughs> too but Tulsa is you know what I mean it's not New York it's not Chicago right it's not right, even Houston right. it's a smaller city right. um it's a little bit weird for there to be all this like nexus of technology and right. you know violence and all this stuff to happen there um so that's sort of weird I might so my inference to, to answer your first question that took five minutes is <laughs> there <under> <laughs> <laughs> but it, it wouldn't shock me if it was only in Tulsa because yeah, because they just got you know it's just it's it's a high concentration of weirdness in this place as yeah. we, we well for the world that they're building so far we know it's some crazy stuff going on in Tulsa and we're gonna see a little bit of that here in a second so the the framing device of the episode is a joke that Laurie is telling Doctor Manhattan we'll come back to that as we go th kind of through the the episode kind of <sighs> come back to it at the end uh, the first part she tells it it's about a bricklayer who's teaching his daughter something and he leaves one brick out. And so the daughter says, I know what to do with it, throws it up in the air. But Lori forgets the punchline. Moves on. <laughs> it just moves on. 
Now, while we are uh, now, while this now she's narr she's narrating this while it goes on, so we see Lori Blake rob a bank. Like this is the tracking shot we see. Right. Lori, Bro- Lori Blake robs the bank. Um, there is a John Grisham is on the Supreme Court according to a newspaper headline. He's retiring. Oh, okay. That's what okay. that newspaper You're was. Right. Okay. 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 Uh, so that's that's neat. Um, and then we see what is essentially an inversion of the opening of The Dark Knight. Yes. Ori yes. robs the bank in order to draw out a right. very, <sighs> very Christian Bale-ish very, Batman. Very, very, very cri- and he had the whole gravel voice and everything. Yeah. It's called Mr. Shadow, right? Yeah, Mr. Shadow, which we find out a couple of scenes. It's named Mr. Shadow. I, I am not sure if that isn't mostly the Christian Bale Batman Begins Batman suit, because this is Warner <laughs> Brothers. They might have just have access right, to it. Right, right, right. Uh, but uh, he is incapacitated after he tries to run away. Uh, Lori shoots him. Uh, one of the other FBI agents asks her how she knew the body armor would stop the bullets, and she sort of just makes his face and walks away. You know, I mean, she, she, she's, she's at the point where, you know, she, she's dealt with so much stuff, you know, as far as, like, costume heroes. Um, you know, she's out there just shooting Batman, you know? Yeah, just <laughs> you know? shooting him, just bang him. <laughs> uh, one thing, so so, the, and that's an interesting thing to find out about Lori right up front because she had spent so much time as a as a you know costumed adventurer. Um, when she was younger, it was a life that was sort of pressed upon her. Yeah. Uh, by her mother, almost as if her mother was saying like, "Well, I wasn't legit. You be legit." It's almost kind of right, like what right, right. what that was all about. Um, and you know, Lori now had holds it would seem all of these sort of vigilante types and dis, just just disdain. Just disdain. Period. Yeah. You could tell by the way she 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 talks about him, the way she just spits venom and everything. Uh-huh. She hates the whole. Maybe not so much hate, but she she just she her her whole attitude towards vigilanteism. Period and everything. Mm-hmm. It was something that was inbred in her, like you said, from her mom. And then, you know, she had her dad go into that, and, there we, and we know that he's the, um, well, if you're a Watchmen reader, <coughs> you know that he was a um, comedian. If you're, and like we was talking about earlier, if you're a PDPedia mm-hmm. reader, a PD, PDPedia reader, Lori took on um, um, the comedian, her dad's um, persona. Comedian. And, and, and yeah, the, and became the comedian. You know, and we see during this episode, um, well, during the first scene, that she's telling a joke. Yep. She never she's telling a this, joke, guys. Telling a joke to Doctor Manhattan, being sarcastic with Mister Shadow. Mm-hmm. She's she's got quips, you know. Uh, sort of like her dad in that way, right? Yeah, she's she's she. Well, she was always sort of like uh, aggressive with her words, and she <coughs> threw that drink right. in her dad's face. Yeah. You know, at the like a, a presidential party or whatever, and and so that's something that I like a lot about the portrayal is that is something that's been you know it's been drawn out of her. You know, like you said, the acid tongue, right. it's her ability to just cut people up, and she continues to do that, and it's one of the best, honestly, yeah. the best things about the show now, in my right, <laughs> in right, my right. opinion. And, and and another thing, guys, we keep um, represent you know referencing the novel. Um, mm-hmm. That's just something that we just commonly you know commonly do here on this podcast, yeah. um, because the source material is so rich with parallels to this series and everything, you can't help but, if you're in knowledge of it, you know, you can't help but reference it. Absolutely. I know, you know, for <coughs> people that are just coming in, we hope that you take this as a, hey, here's what's going on. That's what we're hoping you right, do. Right, exactly. This. We're going to keep you filled in. Um, so, a random New York guy calls her a, a bitch here, which is, you know, I feel like that's stock guy from New York City. They got from, hey, what are you doing over there? You know, he's, he's just in the, in the crowd here. Um, after uh, after this confrontation at the bank, after this faux bank robbery, Lori goes home. She uh, plays Devo with a voice activated computer, so like she yes. has a, she yes. has an echo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, yeah. which actually does seem incredible because we know this is a luddite society and they don't have cell phones and computers like we do. Right? It's not the same way. No, um, no, their technology so, went a different way. You know, yeah. um, and it's just it's just weird. How the um, how the technology is developed in this 2019. Mm-hmm. So she <coughs> feeds her owl. Well, we don't. Find, well, she got an owl. We find out like a little bit. She takes a mouse with a blanket, and then she goes to her bedroom and sensuously regards a briefcase with a blue glow coming out of it, like Pulp Fiction, but blue light, pretty much. <laughs> uh, I I was thinking to myself, and I'm just gonna just in my head, I was like, man, they're acting like there's a dildo in that briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that to myself. <laughs> I mean, that's weird. She's really into that briefcase, right? Oh, uh, man. Something that, that paid hilarious. off. 
obviously. We're assuming you'll watch the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so who? So she. There's a knock at her door, interrupting, mm-hmm. uh, you know, her her sensuous regarding of the briefcase, and it's uh, Senator King. Our, Good our old boy came from um, the previous episode where we seen him um, at the party with Angela. You know, um, Abar um, talking with. Uh, who was she talking with? Uh, he was she talking, was talking with, with um, 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 Judge, Judge's Judge. wife. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so so they have a discussion. Uh, Senator Keene wants her to go to Tulsa to investigate Judd's murder. Mm-hmm. And she says, well, if it doesn't work out, you can't be president. She is. She also abrades him for the DOPA Act, and she, <laughs> she oh, makes fun man. of him. So you're, abrasing. You're, 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 you're really going to call You really guys really call it that? Hey, she just... She just so quick Jane Smart is with these quips and everything. Just a really great way of, um, you know, putting that input as far as, you know, Lori's character. So back up a little bit. So we see some 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 Easter eggs on the wall, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we we see um, the Doc, yeah. Big Boo, <laughs> Doc Manhattan. We see Night Owl. Yeah. Yep. You know, and he's got is, the hood. He's and, got this part, which. Yes. So, so the design on the in the Andy Warhol-esque silkscreen is very similar to the comic book design and has a sort of the owl has a hood on the back of it which is not present in the Zack snyder version not at all not at all not the at all. uh the green goblin version of night owl <laughs> the green goblin <laughs> <laughs> that's what i call it uh so that's really a really really cool thing um we you see know, Oz- ozymandias in the um yes. in the um upper Right Looking very, corner. very oddly similar to that stupid thing I drew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Very, 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 very similar. Uh, yeah, not similar. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah. yeah. And then the, um, um, the way they weighed, oh, they also framed, they had um, Gene Smart A, you know, Lori uh, in the bottom of the panel, you know, uh, right in front of the picture. And then they um, had to pan the, pan the camera right back and show the actual Lori. So it's, it's, it's just funny how they show. These three, we've already seen Ozzy. Mm-hmm. We've seen, um, um, we're now seeing Lori and everything. Yep. So we expect Dr. Manhattan to show up at some point. Well, we've seen him, but not in like any sort of reactive way. We've seen him on cam. Right, like right, this. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right, <laughs> we've seen right, this, right, this right. Dr. Manhattan. But for them to show Night Owls, um, we, they, they didn't show Rorschach. Mm-hmm. Um and who else? Um, that was basically it as far as the um, the Minutemen, right? Yeah. Well, there was Captain. Not not I mean, the not surviving. Minutemen, um, the the um, the surviving. Um, yeah. No yeah, comedian, okay. but he was off doing his own. Really. Yeah. Weird yeah. Thing. Yeah. 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 Comedian. Comedian. Okay. So yeah, the main ones. Um. Um. Ozzy. Um. Dot. Um. Lori and Night Owl. So we need yeah. to find out where Night Owl is. And it seems that he's uh, in custody because uh, Senator Keene says I can. Pardon, president can party, pardon anyone he wants without any limitation, which has no parallels whatsoever to the real world. And then he says, "I can even get your little owl out of, out of the cage," implying that Dan Dryberg is in custody somewhere. Not, not, not her owl. Who you know right. when she was asking when the um Keen was asking who what, you know what what the name of her owl and everything, she was like, "Who, who? <laughs> <coughs> not that owl." We're talking about um you know the um, actual night owl. I know, but the hero, the hero, uh, obviously the owl hero referred to um, in the joke. And if again, if you haven't read the comic, that is a pretty good encapsulation of what he does. He makes gadgets and technology and he's a goody two shoes. Right. That's pretty. I feel like that's fair. Yeah. 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 You know, he has that. That's his Batman tendency. Yeah. He also has a fetish for ladies in costume. So moving on. He does. Uh, So so moving on. uh, The assistant director of the FBI is giving a presentation on Tulsa. And encourages Lori to go. Says, uh, you know, Agent Blake will be taking the point. Wants to send this army of feds uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. She puts the kibosh on that right quick. Yeah. <laughs> says that's not that's not going to happen. Uh, and she says, I'll go. I'll go myself. And then is forced to take someone. So she picks the meekest person I think that she can, and that is uh, that is a guy by the name of Dale Petey. Oh who is man, we our get friend. Petey. We get. Damn, Petey! Finally, is, this, this is a little bit like finding out Santa's real because oh, man. you know right. he's not just he's not just abstract. He's a he's actually a he's character, actually and we character. actually meet him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you guys been um playing you know reading these PDPD files for like the past you know few episodes? Um, 
you know, he the pe- it, it's been a really great way of depicting his attitude and his mm-hmm. um oh, what I want to say here, his um I guess nonconformist way of uh, yeah. his doubt and his skepticism as far as um the the what the, the language he uses in his um in his files and everything. And then to see that parallel to actual to, to, to his actual character in the show, um, Lori picks him as the first guy to take, you know, to Oklahoma. I don't need to take all these guys, but you you know, the FBI guy says that you gotta take somebody, you know, so she chooses him. Let's not forget the following things. Uh, what the thing that Petey is, does here that gets him a little bit of razzing from his boss is he puts pages from the, the Rorschach journal. Right, right, in, right. And what Lori Blake knows <coughs> that better than anybody else in that room than is that room. that's real. That's yeah. as real as it gets because yeah. she knows that Adrian Vate is in, <laughs> behind the D.I.E. because she was at Karnak when it happened. Yeah. Um, nobody else is going to know that. So, you know, she's she actually is taking someone that's got the right minority report here. <laughs> so so uh, good instincts for uh, for uh, for Lori. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about this flight because okay. the next scene here and we move on to this flight and um, Dale Petey has cut holes <laughs> in his sleep mask. So he looks like the Lone Ranger. And he kind of he kind of is trying to break the ice with Lori a little bit, and she doesn't really. Uh, she's she's let him. not taking too much favor to that, you know. No, no. Uh, we see the Millennium Clock, which seems like a big deal. Hmm, yeah. Uh, the fact that What's it's that in Tulsa about? uh is also probably a big deal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, explains what what the hell that thing was on the left <laughs> at the on the very first shot of 2019 Tulsa from the pilots. That's great. Right. Uh, world building here that apparently is going to be important. So that's going to be on the final about the Millennium Clock. On the final, uh, guys. Don't don't forget that it's going to be on the final. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this conversation that she has with Dale. Yeah. <laughs> because she, uh, you know, Dale says you knew Adrian Adrian Vade, right? And and Lori says, uh, Do you just want you want an autograph or something like real brusquely. And you can you can see that Agent Petey is like really mad. Like he does not like being treated that way. At no, all. no, no. The same way he the, the, the how he acts in his um in his in his um files and everything. This guy has an attitude, guys. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's self important, and that's okay. Yeah. Everyone is. So he probably has a podcast in the R. Right about this show, right? It's a showception. Right. Uh, so he says he's like like almost throws up on the word fan. He says, "I'm not some fan." <laughs> Uh, and uh, and that's just uh, Lori seems to be won over a little bit by that. She says, "I knew Adrian Veidt, and I'm I'm not a fan either," uh, which makes sense. Uh, this part, she's, this this is the part where she tells that part about his joke, right? Yeah. Where they go now, we see a montage. They go to the crime scene. They go to Judd's house, and we hear about the you know she tells the part of the joke about Adrian. Um, dropped a squid, killed three million people. Yep. That's pretty pretty good encapsulation. That's pretty much what happened. This is the second time we hear her telling a joke and everything. So um, this is as far as Lori the character and everything. This is something new to us, you know. Yes, and the reason they're talking about Adrian Vate is because uh, Lady True bought Adrian's company and he is now declared dead. And when she opens the Millennium Clock, she opens it with. The quote from the Ozymandias poem, which is, look upon my work, see mighty in despair. Mm -hmm. So there's something tied up, uh, something with Adrian that has to do with that clock. And there's going to be some funny business, I'm sure. That's going to be on the final, like we said. Yep. And that was actually, uh, you know, alluding to um, 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 the title, the chapter. uh, I forget which chapter it was, but it was a title on the the chapter. uh, I can't remember what the the chapter um, which chapter that was in the actual graphic novel, you know, um, look. Oh, the look, look, look on my works, you mighty in despair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was, I lost you. I wasn't following you. It's my fault. Need to get better at that. Following Sam. Which I do when I watch Watchmen and no other time. Because Sam watched chapter the 11. Long. There we look go. Look on my right. works, you mighty. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. So, so sorry, great, great to... callback, great callback, great callback, and great Excellent. Easter egg there. Mm-hmm. So really, really awesome, really, really awesome. Um, so they they go to the they go to the crime scene now, uh-huh. and discover you know some <laughs> wheelchair tracks. What we know are wheelchair tracks, and I guess what Lori also knows. And then we see Lori walk into Judd's house, and then we cut to the 
abandoned warehouse that they use for their hands interrogations. Yeah. <laughs> and <coughs> and uh, this this scene here, um, this scene here between uh, you know Lori Lori Blake and Pirate Jenny and Red Scare is <laughs> is so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is this this scene here did something for the world building for me. Okay. And and I'll I'll say what it is. It it made the first couple episodes made it seem like all of America was like Tulsa, and this is just how how it was in America. Right. right. And this episode makes it very clear that America is not like Tulsa, and Tulsa is like a, a pilot program, and the, it's weird and bizarre, and it's the first time someone really calls out how weird it is. Right. The police are wearing masks. It's just absurd, right? Right. 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 Uh, it's it's kind of crazy, and and it's weird. Because when Lori's there, all of a sudden everyone wants to no, I didn't see anything. I don't know what's going on uh, here. Yeah, uh, every, everybody starts, you know, going into their little hideaways and everything. Mm-hmm. Well, not literal hideaways, but you know, they're getting skittish in their answers and stuff, dancing around things. We'll see that in the next scene when you know she's yeah. talking to Looking Glass. <clears throat> yeah. So she there's almost it's a reverse interrogation. Interrogation. Uh, Lori uh, goes into the pod. We find out, by the way, in, in the pilot, there was music going on during the interrogation, but that was just the score, that which the score, right. mm-hmm. I thought maybe it was in media, but it isn't. Um, and she basically calls the pot a racism detector mm-hmm. in a diminutive way that Looking Glass doesn't like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, back up a little bit, though. Yeah, yeah. So um, we, 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 we get her and we, we see them interrogating like the different um, Nixonville people or whatever, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of funny how this parallels you know, they're using dogs to attack, you yeah. know, to, to, to regulate and everything. And if you really go back in um, history and stuff, you know, this was how, um, you know, dogs were used to attack, you know, blacks, um, mm-hmm. you know, African-Americans and everything, you know, to tame them. So it's just kind of funny how that reverse parallel, you know, reverse, um, um, they, they're they using the same, well, in Tulsa at least, they're using the same tactics to tame the races, you know. Right. It's very Nazistic. It's 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 very much a it is a Gestapo t- tactic, right? Yeah. It's Gestapo mm-hmm. tactic to just round up everyone, and then we'll find out who's guilty and who's innocent, right. and right. you know whatever happens to your civil rights, whatever it doesn't matter. Um, so th- there's very much, you know, this is the the liberal establishment, right? That's who's running the show in 2019, uh-huh. Watchmen America, and it's interesting because this is sort of the oppressive communistic style, totalitarian style dictatorship that, that you maybe would hear hear straw man right i use that term a lot on our blog uh-huh. uh, a straw man is like a weak argument that's not the same argument you were arguing against mm-hmm. it's called a straw man right and these sort of tactics are kind of straw manish in that they're the like the fever dream about a like an oppressive liberal government right right mm-hmm. like as bad as that could get right. with the dogs and everything right um it, it's very it's one of those examples when i when i say and i and i say this to myself all the time uh, this show's very both sidesy. Yes, it's it's very both sidesy. Um, very very and 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 I you know keep going back to those who have thought it was one sided when the um when they saw either the pilot um or just read maybe you know about what was happening going on in the episode that was meant to shock that was meant to actually get you in and you know open your mind as as far as what's going on. But the show itself is mm-hmm. really telling a really great um. Uh, a tale of two sides that yep. one is that, that, that one is not um you you can't call this a liberal type show right you know because it's telling it's, it's trying to tell a, a tale that's um that's just you know it's, it's a delicate balancing act especially when it comes to police especially when it comes to them you know accusing um um people of of certain um acts that they mm-hmm. may or may not have done you know and using tactics to coerce those acts you know, that may not have seemed, you know, be lawful. Like he was talking about Lori coming in and actually, you know, looking at them and looking at all their tactics and and is trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. You know, this is mm-hmm. this is this is this is not the norm. You right. know, um, she's coming from a place of New York where she's trying to take out like the vigilantes and everything. And here they're just letting everything just, you know, um, this pilot experiment program that's going on. Yeah. It's it's pretty much just um it's it's uh, and and um it's the exact opposite of what she feels you know should be going on. It's uh 
It's interesting. It's a real embodiment. And she said, this is a line later where she says, well, you can you tell the difference between a vigilante and a, and a vigilante with a bat and a mask with a badge. Right. And she says, Nope. Uh, what is it? It's like, no, it's like there, I don't either. Right. She says, I don't know either. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's sort of the way she kind of, kind of regards them here. That's so James smartish. <laughs> uh, and again, the delivery of all, of all this is, is should not be lost. I mean, it, awesome. the, the, the timing on all of this is excellent. The line where she's <clears throat> where, uh, looking glass, says can i have the control back like legit says like can i have the control back is is so uh yeah, you know he's yeah, so used to being yeah yeah uh, it's obviously in, he's in off, control off in control yeah yeah we're, we're we're seeing like looking glass you know being in control but when when they're when 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 tim blake nelson and gene smart's in that scene you know we we see gene smart just dominate that scene mm-hmm. you know and eventually looking looking glass has to fall back a bit yeah you know actually pull up his mask in a way you know to um to be because they're he's pretty they're pretty much reach gene smart being there they're they're pretty much in a corner they have to answer questions now yeah what are they doing and why are they doing it you know um give me some you know autopsy stuff and you know okay it was like this and you know they they're they're like you said they're they're skittish in their answers now Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't see that. I was. I did not view. <laughs> I did not personally view this. I was not at this. Right. Uh, totally different. It's. A, it's almost like an IA, an internal affairs investigation. Right. 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 Uh, we know that. We know why there's no tox report. Um, which again, Don Johnson, cocaine. Those things go together like chocolate and peanut butter. <clears throat> yeah. You know. Let's not forget that. Obviously, not. Not. The, not to slander the man. We're just talking about Miami Vice in a fun way. <laughs> uh, so. They find out she, we find out the chief's funeral is in a in a couple hours, and yeah. Lori, Lori changes into something a little different and brings a secret gun to the funeral. Let's talk about this funeral scene. So this yeah. is a pretty intense action scene. Yeah. Um, Angela is approached by uh, Lori and obviously knows like you got to talk to Lori. <laughs> there won't be no avoiding her. Mm-hmm. And then she gives a a, a eulogy that was. Picked out by Judd mm-hmm. after the White Knight and it's singing singing a song. Mm-hmm. I think the last roundup. Uh, a seventh Cav goon pops out of a tunnel in a mausoleum wearing a suicide vest. Right, right, right. And interrupts this this funeral, accusing uh, young Senator Keene of being a race traitor. And says he's going to take Senator Keene hostage. Uh, he says, uh, do not attempt to follow. He's saying, do not attempt to follow us. And Lori just blows his head off. <laughs> but that's a problem because he's got a dead man switch on his vest. So when his heart stops beating, he will explode. Right. Um, and Angela says, everybody, if everybody runs away, Angela rolls the body into the grave, throws Judd's coffin on top of the body, which I don't know why that was necessary because it was already in a hole. And so, so, so this thing was a little weird to me. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm no medical expert or anything like that. So does your, you know, after you get shot in the head, you know, your body, your, does your heart continue to beat for a number of seconds before it just stops? Apparently, you know, I mean, if you it, don't hit if, the brain stem, <laughs> uh, there's like the brain stem has all the background stuff that includes heartbeat and it includes, um, Includes like breathing and stuff. And uh-huh. if you hit, uh, and I'm, and I'm, but remember, we did an ad a couple months ago where we said how what our medical expertise is, I believe. All right. If you haven't seen it, it not doctors. Uh, but I guess probably for a little while because, it, it, you know, you'd have to bleed out. That's still what kills you if you get a head wound because that other stuff will go in the background. So it takes, I mean, I would give it 10 seconds, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> That's it, 10 seconds. Um, so this explosion, right? It's, it's basically the transition to the Ozymandias piece, right? Right. We transition right into, right into uh, Ozymandias, and, and his identity is revealed here, so it is Ozymandias. Uh, the show is being a little coy with us, though, because he they, they kind of have a couple opportunities to say his name and back off on that a couple times right. here. Right, right. But right. they've said now Adrian Vate on the show this episode, right? They, they, they've said they, it. They explicitly say we, 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 and we, and we also see him we this is the third time we see him um you know just get tired of his men you know um 
his servants and everything, you know. Mm-hmm. And he goes and um, is is doing his um, yoga routine or whatever he's doing. Well, we 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 see him um, making something. What is yeah, he doing? He's- He's making a suit. He's making a suit of armor with it's airtight. It has a glass face and has has like an air supply. Okay. Looks like a space suit. Yeah. For for all intents and purposes, and you know, the uh, he he's setting a Mister uh, Mister Phillips up in the space suit, which you know you kind of expect is not going to go Mister Phillips way one way or the other. You know. Man, he uh, he, he just loves experiment with Mister Phillips, man. <laughs> <laughs> Poor, poor, poor Mr. Phillips. Yeah, he's got all these, all these Mr. Phillips. So it looks like there's also some plans for a catapult in Adrian's home. Um, we see, are you ready to go to, what does he say? Are you ready for the great unknown? And then uh, Mr. Phillips, we get a close up of Mr. Phillips' face and it just cuts to his like liquid nitrogen frozen solid right, corpse, right? Right, right. Uh, it's, it's so weird and uh, um and, and, and um you know adrian gets pissed and everything because whatever he planned didn't go right you know it uh, didn't work and everything you know he said he's he goes in search of a thicker skin <laughs> uses a target a target arrow with no arrowhead uh-huh. to take down a bison yeah and he hits it right and he has to hit it in the eye hits it flawlessly because of course he's gonna hit it flawlessly yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's, adrian he's, he's adrian yeah he's yeah. adrian fight he's the world he's the world's greatest athlete in the history mm-hmm. of the world, mm-hmm. and as he walks up to skin his his uh, his quarry, uh, his quarry, uh, a shot rings out at his foot that stops short the classical music, and we see a mass figure on a horse who is shot at his feet. We find out that this is the game warden, and he has sent a letter to Adrian accusing him of malfeasance and violating the rules of his confinement. So. <laughs> Uh, big ups to everybody who said that Adrian is a prisoner of some sort because he obviously is. He is yeah, a prisoner. Right, right. But, uh, and Adrian is thanked for the delicious tomatoes by the game warden. <laughs> Which is, it's just, uh, that's these just, Adrian scenes are so bizarre. It's just, just so bizarre and so weird and everything. It's, it's a tale of two TV shows. You know, it really we got is. the serious thing on one side and then Adrian, you know. When 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 you get so bogged when you get too bogged down in the deepness and like you know the um you know the politics of you know the um the grounded stuff right on um in the Angela's world and everything, you got the Adrian stuff to look forward to to lighten yeah. the mood because it's just what the hell is going on? Why is everything so nutty? You know, and his reactions to the, the the stuff that's going on around him it's just like you know you, you got a guy is, that is just frustrated with the world yeah. it seems all around him so we're trying to figure out what is going on you know in this world and why is he in this and what is this experiment why is you know mr phillips all of a sudden frozen out yeah. um are, are we putting on some tinfoil hats right now i mean uh, are, are we at that point to should let should we finish a little bit of the scene first and then start talking about maybe like a, a couple theories no, let's finish the scene first. Okay. Uh, I want to. I want to mention. Um, I want to. I wanted to mention something here, and that's that uh, when he comes in, we see the cake with the three candles. Yeah. And uh, he basically says, "Happy birthday to the ground." Throws the cake on the ground. It just spikes the whole cake this time. It's so. He's it's so tired of. He's funny. tired of this shit, man. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> it, it's so funny. Just like. Oh uh, man. The uh the the uh, so. He writes a return letter, and it's all this formalized, like how I would never try to escape. And it basically is what he said. Right. Me escape? What? No. You. He says you can repeat your ridiculous accusations in person, and then he says, uh, "I'm glad you. I'm glad you liked the tomatoes." <laughs> it's just so weird, man. Uh, this show is what this show does so well is is it it's, it does so well reminding you that there's a subtext to everything. That's the subtext uh, to everything. Nothing yeah. is nothing is, right. is exactly as presented face value. Um, uh, it, it keeps you off off sort of right. off guard on every right, right. every story. And, and um, it also it also makes you. Um, I, I love the line where um, he 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 referred to himself um what he's making me look like of some sort of serial you know yeah um, republic serial villain re- the exact line he used in that <laughs> was it the, the the penultimate or um the penultimate issue of um um watchman yeah where he says i wouldn't yeah. describe my master stroke before if you could had any chance of stopping or he says i'm not a republic serial villain uh so there's all these there's all these <laughs> illusions and then he d- dictates this letter uh, when I say the co- the show is being more coy than the marketing department, 
uh, Mrs. Crookshanks tries to read the, uh, which is probably, you know, dearest Adrian or something like that. And he, uh-huh. he goes, no, 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 don't read that. But then he says, signs off, Adrian Veidt. And we get a front on shot of him, which finally, is sort of finally, you know, no longer we're finally the seeing manor, him right on see Adrian. His real son. Right, right. We see uh, great confirmation and, still, though. And then he says, uh, Mr. Philip, saddle up your cephalus. I hunted midnight. <laughs> uh, which is so funny. Uh, and then he puts on his Ozymandias costume. And that's where we leave him. Uh, I, I, there's nothing I want more than to see what happens here. Um, I, I'm just so excited to see like where they're going with this. I've got... You want to have some theories here? Hold on a second. You got one of these well, yet? Well, because well, the, I got I, one of these I, here. I don't, I don't have my, you know, I have to, um, you know, go find some some um, tin foil somewhere. First of all, I want to, I was, my, my cheese and smile was just so big when he put on that costume. Oh. That was, that yeah. was awesome. That was awesome. That because was, it's that, very, thank, thank it's you, very Damon. Faithful. You know, you, you, you know, you know what we love, you know. And, and so, it is very faithful to the comic. Very right? faithful. It is. Very, very. It's very Awesome. So not not like the 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 Green Goblin Ozymandias we got ten years ago. We no, get the comic Ozymandias. No, no, no. So here's let's let's do some speculation here. Okay. So, all right. So there's a spacesuit involved. Uh huh. When Mr. Phillips is tied to something, and it seems like what Mr. Phillips has been tied to something and then thrown a distance in a catapult and pulled back is what I think has happened. Uh-huh. And Mr. Phillips is frozen solid. Uh huh. Okay. <clears throat> here's my here's my guess this week, and it will be on the final, so I'm sure I'll get internet points for this. I think that Ozymandias is on Mars. <laughs> I think that Doctor Manhattan is sort of keeping Ozymandias on Mars, um, some sort of punishment for what he did. Um, I think that this is all tied into the to Lady True. I think they probably have blackmailed him in some way. Right. Uh, maybe Doctor Manhattan intervened and said, "We can't let Adrian be in charge anymore. He's he just can't be in charge." Right. Um, so I think that that's who the cap that's who his captor is. Ah. And I think that maybe Doctor Manhattan's created a little a little pocket universe for him there. Um, this is because we see the uh, we see the castle. Doctor Manhattan building the castle on Mars. Um, we also see Topher building this castle. Now. This the suggestion of this is that there is some sort of psychic energy, like a psychic energy is trapping him somewhere. Right. Because that would be a bleed off from. I'm looking at myself. <laughs> hat on. I'm wearing a. I'm wearing a tinfoil hat, just in case it's uh, not clear to our listeners. Um, but basically, I, so I think that this is all connected that way. I don't know exactly how it puts together. It wouldn't surprise me if the Doctor Manhattan on Mars thing is just to put on. The whole time, just to say, Doctor Manhattan is watching when we know that he's off in some other galaxy somewhere. Really, right. um, you know, there's a lot of ways to go with this, but it's, I think that I think it's very possible that Adrian's on Mars. Yeah, I mean, my, that's my um, speculation as well, and everything. How, however, Doctor Manhattan built this world. We know he can build things, you know, just out of pretty much, you know, dust and whatever Mars, you know, has there and made these minions for to keep um you know adrian in check and is using this as a punishment maybe for everything all the events that happened in the um um i don't know because adrian was probably out a while before dr manhattan um well he's been missing for eight years so in 2011 yeah so in 2011 so so okay so so that would be like what 22 years since the die right yeah. Well, he yes, and and PDpedia fills in some of the gaps. Um, check my blog actually recaps this whole thing. Uh, let's dive into these PDpedia files, is what it's called on our website, nerdcyclopedia.com. So check that out. Uh, but essentially, it fills in the gaps um, between eighty five and twenty nineteen. And when Doctor Manhattan said nothing ever ends, this is the prophetic statement, right? Because uh, Adrian can't just leave the world order in place because it's not it's still not going to move in the right direction without his assistance, right? So the entirety of the of the the democratic political apparatus is effectively bankrolled by Adrian. That's right. how he gets them into power and how they stay into power. Right. So for some reason, somebody had to get him out of the way at some point and hold him in captivity rather than just killing him for again yeah, exactly right whatever reason right 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 
Right. So we'll find out more about that, I'm sure, in the coming weeks, because <laughs> otherwise, what what would the point be of having Damon Lindelof do this show? Right. <laughs> They're not well, going to well, the, the big red thing, you know, the red flag was um, um, Mr. Phillips, you know, being frozen and everything. So mm-hmm. that just said a whole lot right there. He and, and obviously, you know, um, the warden, game warden coming there. Um, he's being held captive and he's being and, and his cynical, his attitude and everything this whole time has been because he's just tired of the monotony and you know him building up you know doing the play and everything the guy is bored he's ready to get out um <laughs> it's and 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 the way he plays you know um um the way he's just reacting to his surroundings is just wonderful it's almost like you know if it is dr manhattan and he knows that's his captor it's almost like he made dr manhattan watch this play every night every single night every single night every oh, single night about his yeah. You know, just to get at him. Right. Uh, it, it really makes him such a, you know, again, a, a very dangerous character, a very deep character. Um, you know, he, he could be in a psychic prison. He could be in a physical prison. He could be in a Dr. Manhattan pocket universe. He could be trapped in the Millennium Clock. Yeah. He could be dead. Probably not dead. No, probably not dead. But it could literally be anything because we're dealing with Dr. Manhattan here. He could be stuck in time. I don't know. Um, I, I think I think that we're also going to find out that this is that that Mr. Phillips is a clone of Dr. Manhattan in some way. Some some John Osterman looks like Mr. Yeah, Phillips. I, 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 I'd hope they explain that because in a comic book, we didn't really see Dr. Manhattan. Um, we seen him multiply and everything, but only as blue, you know, yeah. and but we did see him change, you know, shade. So maybe his his powers advance to a point where he can actually become, you know, human. Well, he said he wanted to create human life. Yeah, he did say that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you know, if this, if these, if this is like his best effort and it stinks, <laughs> like maybe that's kind of hilarious. That's it. It, if this is his best effort, it is it's hilarious so far. Yeah. You know, uh, I, the horseshoe thing in the front. So so definitely one of my fav- my favorite piece. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we had Daniel Kibblesmith on last week. This week, his uh, his wife Jennifer Wright tweeted out that she thinks there should be a support group for those who want to have sex with Ozzy Mandius. <laughs> um, I said it starts the same way for all of us googling young pictures of you know pictures of young Jeremy Irons. Uh, that's how we all get our start. So uh, um, a super a wonderfully interesting character and a great portrayal. Again, you know, yeah. uh, also it's the same sort of embodiment of the character that we're seeing with Gene Smart. I think we're seeing with Jeremy Irons. So right. yeah. uh, really between them and uh, you know, uh, it's just excellent acting. All yeah, the way yeah, up. yeah. And I'm, I'm I'm anxious to see how they um, interact or react. Or how this this whole thing crosses with Angela. You know? I want to see what Lori Blake does to him if he oh, shows yeah, up. I yeah. just want to see that yeah. happen. Yes, yes. She, she she shot him once, <laughs> right? She shot him at the end of the comic book, yeah. or tried to. Uh, and but that and that's all we get of Ozzy Mandy is this week. Another cryptic installment in Tinfoil Hat Theater. Take that off because yeah, they, they just talk. need to title that its own show within Watchmen. Just title it, you know, The Adventures of Ozzy. You know, the erotic adventures of Ozzy Mandius, starring Adrian <laughs> Veidt. Uh, uh, you know, uh, no sex, just it's just erotic. But the whole thing's erotic because he's in it. But there's no sex. It's not uh, dirty. Right. All right, so uh, we cut back to Senator Keen making hay of his um, the attempt on his life. You know, when I said it seems like a false flag operation, the only thing that makes me think it, the only thing that skews toward it isn't is that that bomb really blew up. Yeah. Um, that was that. I thought, I thought for a second when uh, when Laurie shoots the Seventh Cavalry goon that it was nothing was going to happen and they were going to be like, what? Why wasn't that bomb real? And that was going to be a whole thing. But this yeah. this way is fine too. Yeah. Um, Laurie decides to interrogate uh, Angela using um, using Dale's coffee, right. uh, <laughs> which she takes off him, offers Angela the coffee, but she doesn't take the bait. Right? She's smart. Right. Uh, she's a cop. But she's smart too, yeah. uh, so so she doesn't take the bait. There's a really great scene here where uh, Lori gives a big long speech to, to Angela about everyone thinks they're the good guy, right? Everyone thinks they're the good guy, but I eat good guys for breakfast. All right. So Senator Keene. So we we cut back to the um, the Tartarus Acres, mm-hmm. uh, founded in 1896, which is the cemetery. And I, and I looked, you know, this scene, you know, going back to it, the the uh, some of the cop cars had numbers on them. Uh, they were three two eight six nine seven three nine and six four five eight. All meaningless, uh, as far as I could tell. Not. When, I thought they were dates for a second. I wrote them out, looked them up. 
garbage. Nothing. Okay. Nothing. Just random. Um, so to get back to so Senator Keene is making hay out of the fact that there was an attempt on his life. Yep. Um, makes me think it's a, maybe a false flag operation because it would be the type of thing to boost his profile for the coming presidential bid. He makes all those strong statements that you'd want a leader to make, of course, but right. if they're nefarious, they're nefarious. Um, Laurie steals Dale's coffee. <laughs> Just takes it right out of his hand. Just takes it right out of his hand, yeah. Right out of his hand and, and goes to find Angela in the mausoleum. Uh, Angela is uh, searching the tunnel with the Dan goggles, with the owl goggles. Mm-hmm. And Lori offers her a coffee and gives her a long speech about whoever did this thought they were the good guy, and so are the people in masks, uh, which uh, Angela does not appreciate. That you know, uh, there's a speech where she says, uh, you know, I eat good guys for breakfast. Yeah. And then Angela goes, ooh, like that. <laughs> uh, that really tells you everything you need to know about uh, these this matchup. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's 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 going to be a force to be when you know um um for force for you know Angela to be dealing with her and vice versa. So they're going to be knocking heads. But how about um when 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 um Lori asks Angela about what she found in the closet? Yes. And then um you know um she goes into well how do you know about the closet? Well I yeah. have experience with those type of things. <laughs> well, 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 when Lori says, you know, he had a secret compartment in his closet. Mm-hmm. Angela doesn't go, what? She goes, what'd you find in there? <laughs> Which, as someone that watches a lot of investigation discovery, I'll tell you, is not the type of thing not you want to say to deflect suspicion. Yeah, 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 exactly and everything. Police officers don't hear that and go, well, everything's fine. You know, they don't do that. Uh, but, but- Angela... But we know Lori has, uh, you know, experience with, you know, uh, secret compartments and everything. Yes. You know, her dad. <laughs> My dad had a secret compartment, so I figure everyone, everyone's got one. Uh, in the uh, very, so... in the very first, well, not the very first, you know, with the very first scene that we seen in the, um, in the first chapter of Watchmen, you know, the detectives find us the uh, comedian secret. Um, um, Rorschach does. Rorschach, no. Yeah, Rorschach does. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're he beats right. the detectives at their own right, game right away, right, showing right, him his competency. Right, you're right. I hashtag hate Sam because I know I should yeah. not. I should. I should have remembered that. Yeah. Oh well. If if we got in trouble every time we said something a little <laughs> off on here, I'd be you know, uh, you wouldn't be losing. I'll put it that way. Uh, so Angela doesn't take the bait uh, with the DNA with the coffee, right? Uh huh. She says I ain't, I ain't touching that, which is smart because her DNA would show up. Uh, since she's related to the real perpetrator of the crime, who she is now working on a cover-up for, right? Right. A family right. member. Um, so Angela doesn't take the bait. The FBI agents go back to their hotel. <laughs> and we see what's in Lori's briefcase, which is an enormous, enormous blue Big blue. Dildo Big with blue. detachable balls, by the way. Oh, man. That apparently are some sort of like battery pack, I guess. Was that uh, a, um, 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 a Manhattan porno? It's an Esquire magazine. It must be some ah, racy okay, photo okay, shoot. Okay, okay, okay. The the Doctor Manhattan in this on that magazine cover uh-huh. looks really cool. Looks yeah. like a kind of a blue man, a naturalish blue man group. Right. And it's a racy title. It's I think it's um, Silk Spectre takes Manhattan, which is really dirty. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, we can see that we can see that Lori has some unfinished business uh, with with with, with, with her Doc. feelings with Doc. Yeah, yeah, apparently so. So we we know from the graphic novel, or you know, mm-hmm. um, we know from the graphic novel that she she had a relationship with the Doc. You know, then she um had her long relationship with Dan. Well, don't know how At long least 10 that years. lasts. About ten years. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she's um she's rekindled feelings for the doc because when last we left Lori, she, her feelings for the doctor was um you know he he, he the doc you know Do- dr manhattan really didn't have any type of early you know he didn't have any connection to like humans and mm-hmm. Lori was like the last real connection that he had and then once you know everything happened with you know um the squid you know I, the the whole event and everything he went off to mars you know, um, Lori and Dan was um, had their final sex scene and everything. You know, within the, um, the graphic mm-hmm. novel, so they had a relationship for a while. So I'm just trying to figure out where she is rekindling this from. Where it's all this coming from, as far as her um, feelings again, tw- you know, for for the doctor. 
Well, it's hard. It's hard to say. You know, it seems certainly sexually that it would be hard to imagine what a being of Dr. Manhattan's abilities would be like as far as the ability to give you pleasure in bed. Right. 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 Uh, I, I, you have to imagine that's got to be. I mean, I, we'll just call it a 10 out of 10. I, I mean, I don't know that we need to. Well, get I, I don't know how the, how you interpret it in a book. I didn't get that from the, the text, you know, no. in, um, in, in Watchmen and everything. No. So this is all new here. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's interesting because it's like this this idea of satisfaction that she uh-huh. derives from herself mm-hmm. but uses Dr. Manhattan as like an avenue toward that. Yeah. In, in that way, it's a weird parallel for how, you know, how Dale sort of said, like, your ex, yeah. Dr. Manhattan, <laughs> the most powerful the most powerful being in existence, right? Uh-huh. It's the same sort of memory. And, and, you know, in 1985, we, we discussed this, uh, about the book. Lori was wanting to be seen not as a sidekick, mm-hmm. right? She was finding out who she is. And now she's, it's almost like she's pining for those days when she was a sidekick. Right. And now she has all this responsibility. She's seen as agent Blake and she's in charge of, you know, she's she calls the shots. Yeah. Um, right. And, but and, she's still uh, there's something about Dr. Manhattan and her vigilante life that is still has an attraction. She has a lust for that part of her life still. So, yeah. so as a symbol, right, this big, enormous blue phallic <laughs> symbol. Right, right. You know, as that standing in for her, her youth, for her, you know, her vigilante career, and and for when she was at the four, you know, she was Doctor Manhattan's girlfriend, which yeah. is like kind of like being yeah. Rick Sanchez's daughter, right? <laughs> you have options, right? Well, also it's a Lois and Clark, it's a Lois and Superman type of thing. You know, once you go with Superman, I mean, anybody else trying to measure up is just going to be, you know. Um, maybe the relationship between her and, you know, um, Dryberg, Dan Dryberg, um, just wasn't happening. So um, she went back to what she was used to, you know, or she's pining for what she was, you know, what she was used to that, 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 that pleasure that she derived at 10 out of 10, you know, that she had with him wasn't with real Dryberg. And considering the fact that Lori has changed so much since we last left her like 30 years ago, this is sort of like coming full circle for her. Mm-hmm. it's like and she her feelings it's like the she feels like she's at her like um she derives pleasure for reminding herself of what it was like to be that person right almost right and that's why and that's why the the magazine's important to that because that's that's a fantasy of her in her youth yes yes because yes. the actual physical like dildo <laughs> yeah that actual thing you could replace with a, another item and, and 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 one thing and remember what did her mom say in the final issue you know um the future you know memories you know present gets is grimy yeah the yeah, past gets brighter all the time the past gets brighter all the time yeah yeah so so she's so when we when that's a lot of talk about the blue dildo right that's a lot of- <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna blue. call we're gonna name it. We're gonna name it Gary. So Gary's there. <laughs> Gary. So she. So she's looking at this. So she doesn't use. She doesn't use it, but she does take it out and kind of put it together and and kind of look at it and think about it. But she chooses to sleep with with Dale instead, which is a rejection of that. Yes. 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 Life and yes, an embracing yes, of her right, role in the FBI. Right. Right. So it's 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 a completion of, of the symbol. It's also probably a favor for Dale, you would imagine. Uh, I don't feel I, his, you know. like, you know, whatever fantasy he had and everything, you know. I mean, he's wearing the mask. Yeah, so... Right, right, right. So so his little re- his rejection of the fan, you know, being a fan. I mean, he's really the ultimate, you know, mm-hmm. fan boy when you yeah. really come to, you know, beg, you know, to think about it, especially if you're reading those Pedia files because he's really obsessed with, you know, like the um the men and men story and everything. You know, um, he has strong feelings about about how the comedian is portrayed and and you know, definitely check out the files because they're from Dale. You know, you know Dale now. He's a friend of ours, a friend of the show, <laughs> Dale Peeney. So uh, after this, you know, Lori can't sleep. Still, she goes and tells Doctor Manhattan the jokes that we've heard. 
the joke ends with the uh, the girl from the beginning of the show saying, you know, I'm the woman, I'm the girl that threw the brick and then God dies, right? Um, so when Lori leaves the Dr. Manhattan phone booth, Angela's car is dropped <laughs> right out of the sky, almost from, hits from, from the last episode, it was picked yeah. up and now it's dropped. Right. What a way to um to end that episode, you know, the way to end the last episode with the with with them being picked up, and we don't know what what the heck you know what the heck happened to um Will, <laughs> but the car you know Angela's car is just dropped. So where the hell is Will? You know, nobody knows. So that's and that's the mystery. Uh, you know, uh, Lori laughs maniacally, uh, sort of like you know like the Joker almost. Um. And we think it was probably Dr. Manhattan that dropped it, you know, I mean, something. I mean, it could be the true set, you know, who knows who yeah, someone, yeah. it seems maybe inter, in, uh, intercepted her message. Right. Uh, it, it definitely see, seems um, I want to talk just a second. I want to go back to the high scene just for a second before okay. we go move on to, to our, our, our wonderful guest, uh, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, so this inversion of the Dark Knight introduction. So the Joker is uh, ostensibly a funny character, right? Yeah, he's he's laughs and he, he tells jokes and his gags and all that stuff. And that that robbery scene at the beginning of the Dark Knight is a is an introduction of of the the Joker. Mm -hmm. And this scene is a trap for the Batman character sprung by the comedian who ha. would tell jokes. Yes. And and yes. so it's even a, it's a very tight sort of mirror image of that yeah. and i wanted to call yeah, that out that's yeah, that's a very very great call out right there yeah. you know um and a great homage because that was a very great scene yes um you know it's iconic pleasure. that scene right. is that, definitely that, iconic. That's, that, i mean it's a definitely memorable scene and it's a great way um to to get your introduction to the joker in that universe and made him yes. very terrifying in that instance and this does that too uh laurie uh, again you know i can't say enough about uh, Gene Smart's performance uh, yeah. as his character. Uh, I'm so excited to see where we go. And to be honest with you, it feels like the it feels like the main character of this show is here now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she finally arrived, and I'm going to mm -hmm. love seeing how her and Angela, you know, interact and everything. And you know, is is if it, if this is if this, it's this season is only nine episodes, man, we're just barreling through this plot. You know, we're already on three episodes, and it's feel like it's been like, you know, it's you know, time is just like zip by and everything. And we, and and I've been so overloaded with information regarding this show. You know, the PDPD files, like you know, come very next day. All of a sudden, we got more content. You know, yep. we have to digest and everything. You know, with this show. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a layer upon a layer upon a layer, which is in 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 some ways perhaps the best homage to the source material that you can do. It's a love. It's to just be it's a dense love letter to the Watchmen. Just like a, just like some underproved bread. <laughs> it's not proved right. Yeah. Plenty of proving here. Uh, uh, bubbles within bubbles. So that's our that's our deep dive for the recap of the plot. And uh, well, oh, one other thing I, I wanted to mention here. Okay. So the action of this this takes place on like September eighth or September seventh. Some of the action takes place yeah. September September seventh, twenty nineteen. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, is ninety six degrees. Ooh. And all these all these the funeral scene. Ah. Um. You know, uh, Lori is wearing like a uh, like a muffler, mm -hmm. you know, through part of this a jacket. You know, she's wearing a <laughs> scarf. You know, why is it so cold in Tulsa, Oklahoma in September? Ugh. That that's either a, a such a strong statement about global warming or B, there's some other uh, something. There's more to this. There's more ah. to why it's so. Cold. And, I, and I think that that the fact that they called it out as being September, like they said the date. It's not November. It's not Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's September, September like 20th yeah, or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a definite. Where's your tinfoil, man? It's, it's, I mean, you know, we need that. <laughs> right yeah. there, ladies and gents. Now, and, and and with that being said, now that I am wearing the tinfoil hat, this is what all guests want when they are introduced. They want to be introduced by someone looking that legit. Uh, <laughs> let's just transition over to uh our interview this week with uh which is uh with a former professor of mine uh, dr jeremy lawrence i give him a good intro we have a great conversation uh, about comics and everything and uh you know with that being said uh i'll let me take it away all right all right so, all right, guys. So we are joined today by Dr. Jeremy Lawrence, who is the Assistant Provost for Academic Innovation and Strategic Planning 
for West Liberty University. Uh, he is also a English professor in the liberal arts department, I believe, and he is the foremost expert on cricket literature in the state of West Virginia. Uh, Dr. Me. Lawrence, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, how are you doing today? Doing great, doing great, Scott. Nice to see you again. Oh, it's nice nice to see you again, too. Uh, Dr. Lawrence was my last college professor, the very last one. Uh, <laughs> the very, <laughs> so, very last one? Okay. Yeah, All the right. final hurdle uh, was his class. So, <laughs> so um, we are, we're going to talk to him a little bit today um, about Watchmen, uh, which I guess is a surprise, uh, understanding where we are uh, and where you are today, our, uh, our viewers. Um, he is... Uh, his interests um, include comic studies, and I know, uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, recently you were the chair of, I believe, a symposium on Batman. Um, is that correct? I was the chair of a panel of different instructors who had been using Batman comics in various ways uh, in their classes. Uh, wow. I was the only literature uh, professor in the group. We also had a psychology uh, professor uh, who has written a book on Batman and uses uh, Batman characters to explain psychological conditions. Uh, oh. We had a pop, we had a pop culture scholar, which pretty obviously that's you know why that person's going on. And then we got a communication uh, teacher. So yeah, it was it was a panel of uh, I'm trying to remember now who everybody was there, but about four or five of us who had in some way or another had Batman related classes. And I had I have taught a Batman class. Now Scott, which one were you? What, what class were you in? Oh man, it was just like an English. It was like like a survey because I was like a I was uh, a core class short <laughs> in my four years. <laughs> so yeah, but I I've taught a uh, I had a I had a class on just purely Batman that I didn't think they'd let me teach, uh, but I did uh, where we looked at Batman through the decades uh, as a way of kind of looking at the way American culture was changing at the time, and it's which it was a pretty cool class. And then I've taught two classes. Uh, Related to Batman and Superman, uh, kind of looking at those, the uh, looking at characters throughout uh, literary history, starting with mythology of uh, characters, you know, superheroes with superpowers, and then superheroes without superpowers, like Ulysses. And so, uh, oh, wow, and, yeah. So I've taught, so I've used, I use, uh, uh, again, I could go on and on, <laughs> but I've I've taught around five, I've taught a, close to ten comic graphic novel oriented classes history of graphic novel uh you know I, i've have focused more on the superhero genre uh but i also do a lot of uh, uh some of uh, the more biographical uh, graphic novels as well oh wow I'm just so trying cool. to figure yeah. out why um, my mom didn't send me to your school. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we, we do we do have a minor and a track. We we it just so happened there were about three or four of us who really got into teaching comics, uh, and uh, I was kind of late to the game. I uh, I didn't really get into it until uh, someone named Scott McCloud. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, yes. understanding comics. Yeah, uh, yeah. He came to West Liberty and gave a series of talks, and oh, really. Wow. And when he was talking, I said, wow, that's that's something that I can kind of see how this might work in the classroom. Because I I read the only comics I really read growing up were Transformers because I was a big Transformer fan. Oh. And I grew up in a really small rural town in Arkansas where the only place you could buy comics were the Kroger's. And so there were oh, very yeah. few yeah. comics. And so I was really the Transformers. That was it. And I never got back into it. Uh, but then Scott McCloud really piqued my interest. And. And so I thought this might be some way, something I might do in my classes. And so since I never had really read really any graphic novels at all, I went to the Internet and said, best graphic novels. And, of course, Watchmen uh, came up uh, pretty quickly. So the first, graphic, the first graphic novel I ever read was Watchmen which in some ways ruined comics for me forever because I <laughs> yeah that's yeah i mean that's like having the i guess the best sex ever and then having the ever <laughs> that is not a bad analogy no it was but no yeah it's it it was i didn't plan it that way i didn't realize how much i was going to like it and how i didn't realize at the time just how influential the the graphic novel was and uh and i I became a little obsessed with Alan Moore at that point, uh, just yeah. because he was my first foray mm -hmm. into comics. And so I also had a class on Alan Moore. That was one of my favorite classes. But uh, 
Well, one thing I want to ask you. Um, so you you said you got I into it more with the trans. I used it. You you got in you got into comics more with the Transformers, but you said Watchmen <laughs> was more. It was it more of a graduation of, or you you already understood how comics and you know panels and everything works. So, how did Watchmen really affect you? You know, um, when when you first after reading you know, Transformers, going from Transformers to Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, with Transformers, I love the characters, I yeah. love the toys. And right. It was a story that I was, I wasn't really paying that, I wasn't even paying that much attention to the, uh, the art uh, and the, and the really, I mean, actually the Transformer comic books are not that bad in terms of death. They're actually some pretty cool uh, story. I've gone back, I've gone back and looked at them. Uh, but what really, what, what got me when I first started looking at comics and I was coming at it from a, well, I'm, I'm interested in seeing something. <laughs> new it's been a while I've, I've read so many different types of literature i've been studying and teaching i want something new and so uh I, so that's one reason why watchmen kind of jumped out at me is it was just a really a whole other medium that i hadn't looked at from a critical perspective and i think ah. sometimes i think sometimes people think you overanalyze things you ruin them and i think that's true to a certain extent but i started to gr gain more of an appreciation uh and it, i really credit scott mcleod uh if I had not seen his presentations, I don't think I would have appreciated what I was seeing as much as I did. Okay. And uh, and of course, Watchmen's one of those you go back and you see new things over and over again. Oh, yeah. uh, and so what really got me, and there was some resistance uh, at, at my school to teaching comics, not surprisingly. Uh, and uh, one of the and, and I kept using Watchmen as kind of my example. Again, everything kind of comes back to Watchmen for me. And the the thing that I often said when I was defending the the comics as literature, which I'm there. I don't I don't think as far as I'm concerned, it's not even a debate anymore. It's it's literature. Yeah. Uh, it's a form of literature. And I said, look, I, I'm not saying it's better than traditional literature, be it poetry or fiction or drama. I'm not saying it's worse. I'm saying it's a completely different medium that does things that other mediums cannot do. Every medium has something that it can do that others can't. And there, you know, there are other things. And, and of course with comics, there are, I mean, there are a lot of those, and, but of course the visual element is first and foremost, there. one of the, you know, the characteristic that makes it different than other forms of, of literature. Although I will say before I, got into comic studies, I was already, without even thinking about it, already kind of doing stuff with comic studies because my most of his poems he published through with illuminated manuscripts where he was using images that went along with the text. And the way he described it is they weren't illustrations. They were meant to be part of the art itself. And so I was already doing textual criticism on Blake and I've oh. actually since back and I started using comic studies to help me understand what's going on with Blake more. But, uh, but no, I, th there are certain things and well, I mean, I know, I'll, I'll give you an example uh, for me. And I mean, I know you guys have talked about Watchmen quite extensively, but the, uh, the kind of my big aha moment was the first couple of pages of chapter four. And this is the scene where uh, where Doctor Manhattan is with the photograph, you know, and he's dropping the photograph. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah. Like, he's like, "I've already dropped the photograph," and that's the those two pages are the two pages I use in my presentations when I talk about how spectacularly awesome comics can be as a form of literature because I'm showing them. If you look at those two pages, right, and the looking at all the side by side images of Doctor Manhattan, him talking about the images and how images have already been here and images have not been here. And, you know, you're, you know, the idea of this, when you see the stars, you're seeing light from, you know, thousands yeah, of years. Yeah, ago, yeah, right? Yeah, right. So you're literally, you're literally seeing the past and, you know, it, it, you know, and same thing with photographs. And so, but what's interesting when you, because you don't think about this when you're looking well, at least most normal people don't, right. When you're looking at a comic book page, you do see what's coming up, right? You can't stop. Your, your eyes are going to see, oh, there's an explosion over here right, or, or right. something's going to, you see it coming unless it's on a, you know, you turn the page. And right. so you are 
the page is I think going on there because you can see the future in comics and you can see the past in the comics as you're going down the page. And so and when when I kind when I kind of light clicked on, it was kind of ah, this cannot be done in any other medium, right? I mean it's it's again it's not worse or I mean film can kind of do it, but even film it's different because they're making you see what's next. You know, you're not allowed to go back and right. you know rewind as you're watching. So so it's that was my big aha moment, the first couple of pages of chapter four. I mean, I was really already getting into it, but those couple of pages, like, man, what there's something going on here. And I kept going back and reading it and looking at the images and uh and so yeah, so Gibbons, you know, Gibbons' role in this whole thing is just, you know, that's what again, it helped me also appreciate the role of the artist because he's is I mean, I know it's cliche. I mean, he's Easily, you guys have probably already talked about this. He's just as much a creator of Watchmen uh, as as uh, as Moore, although yeah. Moore Moore gets lion's share of the attention, obviously. Yeah, because he's he's the um, I guess the 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 head of it. Um, but you also have to figure in John Higgins too, because every time I'm, we talk colorist, about yeah. <laughs> the colorist and everything, he's a very <laughs> integral part, you know, in the um, in yes. in the whole series itself. How 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 would you say your students react when you um, present not only comics, well, not only Watchmen, but you know, just comics to the oh. you know period. Well, I'll, is, I'll kind of backtrack, I'll backtrack a little bit. And my okay. I mentioned the Batman class earlier. Yeah, uh, and that was that was started off as an honor seminar, uh, and uh, where you petition, a, you kind of propose a class, and then they accept it. And that was the Batman class, and. In the Batman class, I had 20 students. Uh, three of the students were three guys who were Batman fanatics. They, they loved Batman. They were really excited about the class. 17 of the students were girls or guess, women who had never read a comic book in their lives. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, and not the gender stereotype. That's just how the class was set up. And after about a week of class, the students who had never read comics came in and they're like, that was exhausting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they were ex like, they're like, we were expecting, you know, this to be an easy read and it's not a hard read, but I was having them look at things I, I went over the whole, all of Scott McCloud's types of, you know, theories and discussions about how the panels work and looking and, and they were just talking about how exhausting it was to read the comics because they, they, they weren't used to doing it. And right. so, okay. So, so that was a really interesting uh, uh, thing that I didn't expect that, you know, and that it ended up being a lot more difficult for them to do it. I think, I mean, if you're used to reading them, I think you kind of take for granted that you're able to figure out what's going on. It's you, it's clicking easier if you're used to the language of comics and the way comics are set up. And right. especially when you start to get some more complicated comics where just where do you go next? You know, which panel do you go to? I mean, again, we take for granted that that's simple and you start getting things like game and Sandman where things are going all over the place. Right, and so, right. um, at least with Watchmen, it's pretty, you know, they, yeah, the, the oh, nine panel thing is, is, is straightforward right. and everything. And as you were saying, we were, we were trained because we've, we've pretty much grown up on comics. So we know the language, you know, it's already, you know, already knowing the language and everything. So that's right. very, 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 very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, and uh, and I will say by the end of the class, I, I still get emails from some of the uh, the girls from that class who have now become, uh, in their words, comic book geeks. Uh, they felt, <laughs> and uh, they're like, "Oh, have you read this? Have you read this?" And so, so they were turned on, and, and and they're still reading. Well, that's another question. Actually, uh, I think about some of these questions all the time. So, <laughs> kind of the medium of comics has been more of a male dominated medium. So yes. with you introducing, you know, to that, you know, that element to students in your class, um, you maybe answered a little bit of it. How many of females have taken to, um, to, to, oh. to, 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 to going on, <laughs> you oh, know, as far well, as reading? I, when, well, that was, you know, that was one of the first classes I offered. And uh -huh. because it was an honors seminar, it was a kind of closed off class. But pretty much whenever I've offered just a straight comic oriented class i would say it's easily 50 50 uh really wow in, term, yeah, in terms awesome. of the students, yeah i mean and uh yeah I, I, easily i would say it's 50 50 among the students who are hardcore comic fans you know you have some students who just are either casual fans or just 
interest in it. Those students who are really hardcore, I would say it's about 50, if not a little bit higher with the, with the, with the, the girls. Uh, they, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you still, uh, unfortunately, the idea of finding female characters is still lacking. Right. You know, that, uh, right. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something that Watchmen does touch on as well, but, uh, but it, it's, as terms, it, as readership goes, they're pretty strong. Uh, in fact, uh, I told, there were three of us in our department who kind of at the same time discovered that we liked doing this, which is how we kind of started to develop a program. Uh, one of, uh, one of, there's three of us and one is a, um, a woman, uh, okay. Dr. Dominique Osh, uh, and she's very proud of her, uh, uh, girl geek uh stat <laughs> although i i, I kind of told her i said look i don't know if this is even that much of an anomaly anymore no, <laughs> because yeah it's it's, it's, uh, it's a it's a changing form and it's it's better it's that much better for it because you get a lot more input and it's just not mill it once well, you get more creative i mean it, right. it makes it a whole lot you know it makes the medium a whole lot more well-rounded well i will say you know and this is kind of me get, getting into a little bit more of my uh, my own personal research interest, although I haven't been doing as much of it lately, is I would say even more than uh, the the male-female uh, dichotomy, I think race is an even more interesting, you know, we, if you start looking at which, you know, who is interested in comics, you know, mm-hmm. you don't see as many African-American, uh, you know, kids in the comic book shops or in my, you know, Scott can tell you we don't have a super diverse uh, population right. at West Thirty, <laughs> anyways. <Right. laughs> uh, but, but no, I, and I've and I've been really interested in uh, studies along those lines uh, that look at um, you know the the milestone uh, black superhero comics and the kind of the need they, they feel like they needed to have something of their own and right. So yeah, so, but but I would say that's in my mind more prevalent right now than the the issue you know men and w- versus male female. I would say race is actually maybe a little more uh, of an interesting, uh, you know, gap right, right now. That, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah, I, I love. I did a, I did a class on. <laughs> sorry, it was. Uh, I, I do, a, I do a lot with sport literature, and so oh, I did okay. a lot of work with. Uh, quite possibly, I think the greatest graphic novel of all time, uh, Superman versus Muhammad Ali, which ah, is okay. American. <laughs> Did Superman take a Does Superman take a dive in yeah. that, or is he? I, I don't want to give away the ending. No, I <laughs> no spoilers. I actually, I, I actually joke. I actually, I do think it's a little. It's very. It's a. I do think it's an interesting uh, way of looking at really race relations in the set. It was published in in seventy seven. Yeah. Uh, and just male, you know, black masculinity in the seventies and Muhammad Ali because this idea that you know. There weren't that many superhero black superheroes for right. you know for you know young black boys and girls reading uh, right. comics. So the idea that well, well Muhammad Ali is the closest we got, right? right. <laughs> this idea. Right. Uh, and in fact, there's a reggae song at the same time called Muhammad Ali, the Black Superman. And so <laughs> there, this is you know the lack of. Uh, and so um, I found that really interesting. And so that whole. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't, you know, it's interesting. It doesn't really come up. It's one of the few things that doesn't really come up in Watchmen, I don't think, is the, the race issue, the, well, the gender sense. issue, definitely, uh, but uh, not so much. The race the... thing is something that the show's touched on a lot. Okay. So that... it's, in, it's, it's, it's brought up um, a lot of the action centered around the Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre of 1921. I saw, um, yeah. Crazy, crazy. It, it, one of the one of my blogs I recently wrote uh, that basically what they're doing with the show is creating a world where um, the conspiracy theorists are right because right. because right. of course the premise and, and this is spoilers for the graphic novel but we've we've given you so many warnings on that <laughs> our, our <laughs> listeners um, the premise is is all based on uh, on Adrian Veidt dropping a squid in the middle of of Manhattan right um, right um, I recently posited that. Um, he was ultimately responsible. Uh, he was ultimately wrong for doing this because he created the crisis itself, right? He created the precipitating crisis. Um, earlier, you mentioned that you talk about the Batman sort of archetype of a superhero as a Ulysses type, mm-hmm. right? So how much of that sort of the the creation of, of your own crisis is, is prevalent in, in the Odyssey there? Because I know that there's sort of like a... Um, like the impetus to leave is something that Odysseus sort of creates and he sort of prevents himself from getting back to Ithaca, right? 
Is that, I'm just saying, like, when he's... <laughs> maybe I lost my train of thought there. Did I lose my train of thought, Sam? <laughs> Did I lose my train of thought there? So here's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> well, the bad thing is you were going out of... I, lo- I started losing the feed right at the same time, so I think oh, it was maybe... Okay. Cool. Well, thank goodness. I thought I was losing my mind there. So thank God. Hey, it was just a tech issue, yeah. folks. Not not an inside, <laughs> outside tech issue. Uh, that sort of stuff happened. So so basically, I guess what I'm getting at is, in what ways is Ozymandias... Um, is what in what ways is Ozymandias kind of similar to Odysseus, right? Yeah. In what ways is that archetype, or what we would call a Batman tendency? Like, what ways is that something that's carried carried through the literary tradition? Well, uh, well, or would you even consider them comparable? Copy I'm trying copy. to think. I mean, there are there are. I mean, the the idea, especially given the fact that really, as far as I'm trying to think here, Manhattan is really the only one with actual superpowers here, you know, that, uh, and so everyone else is in some ways Batman-esque, right? Where they have heightened, you know, with, with Ozymandias, you know, the super, uh, uh, intelligent, but also pretty nimble. So he's, he's very similar to Batman in that regard in terms of his powers, right? He is, a uh, a Batman-esque. I mean, definitely not attitude wise, but also, I mean, if you think about it, there are some interesting parallels. They're both completely rich beyond, you know, and they're able right. to do what they do, uh, because of that. And so ability wise, mental wise, you know, there's that. And so I do think that what Moore is kind of getting at here and, and what's working at is the question at the end is, I think is, which is again, kind of full disclosure here. I told Scott, I have not seen the television series yet. I, I, I wanted to, and I haven't been able to see it yet, but one of the things that I'm, that I find problematic about it, and I'm going to watch it, is that one of the things I think makes Waxman so great is it ends on that question where you are forced to ask yourself if you're not, if you're not, you know, kidding yourself, well, is he right? Right. Yeah, D- yeah. Is this for the good? Right. right I mean, yeah. um, who was, you know, is Rorschach right? Is Ozzy Bandy is right? And in this kind of question, if you think about it, this is, Again, Moore's deconstruction of the whole superhero genre. If you the whole idea of Batman, for example, this vigilante, right? And we forever we see him as this good guy, but right as, as this is coming out, at the same time, you have Dark Knight Returns, right? Uh, the, the, the the same year mm-hmm. that Watchmen is coming out, where this completely version, new version of Batman that people had not thought about, where. He, where Frank Miller really emphasized that fact, like, look, he's a vigilante. He's yeah. breaking yeah. the law, right? And despite what we're thinking, he probably is killing people when he throws people off buildings, right? It, it's, it's, he is, you know, dangerous in some ways, right? And so this idea, of, is he good? Is he bad? And then, and that's, that, I think more than that might be what's going on with Ozymandias here. This, this, this ambiguity of, you know, because he is the bad guy, right, mm-hmm. in the graphic novel, but at the same time, you're, you're forced to ask yourself, well, is he, right? I mean, is if this is for the good, right, if mankind does come together uh, because of this this threat, then is does the you know does the end justify the means type of thing, right? That's a real big oversimplification of it, I know, but yeah, <laughs> so I'm, that's something I'm, I am interested in seeing how the uh, the series takes that because it sounds like in some ways they're going to start to answer that or kind of respond to that in some way. But. Well, in, 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 a, in a lot of areas where um, if you're a big hardcore Watchmen fan, you didn't really want that material touched by anyone because that mm-hmm. is the sacred, sacred, sacred ground right there. But yeah. um, me and Scott have been watching or been podcasting these past three episodes. The, right. he, it's, it's, it, Damon Lindelof is, writ, is more or less writing a love letter to that right. series, and he's mm-hmm. done a great job so far. I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm going to watch it. I have no, I, I will. <laughs> you will I, watch the Watchmen. <laughs> I will watch it. I will say that I, re, I refused at one point. I'll probably will at some point to, um, to read before Watchmen. Uh, I, oh, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't bring myself to do it. Yeah. Uh, Part yeah. of my loyalty. Part of that was my loyalty to Moore. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Same here. But, Same here. But, at some point, I'm going to have to look at it right, and see what's going on. But I, the the television show did it piqued my interest enough to be to, to see what's going on there, especially Lindelof. I love him. So. Awesome, awesome. Do you have a favorite um character? Watchmen. Yeah. Ooh. Um, or 
character stands out to you the most because they all have like like, comedian. I do like you know just like the comedian. Comedian, okay. Yeah, because I mean, there's a difference for me, and this is the the conversation I have with my son all the time because we're reading Harry Potter, and it blows his mind that my favorite character is Snape, and I'm just like, well, it's not because I like him; it's like he's the most interesting, right? I mean, he has the (laughs) most depth. You know, he's the one I want to. So, so for me, it's this idea: who do I like? And and that's one actually that is one thing about Watchmen is there really isn't. I don't think a single person you could say, well, he's perfect or she's perfect. They all have problems, right? right. They all yeah, have right. um, in their own way. So I do think the comedian is the most interesting one uh, in terms of uh, the way he we're the way we're you know, obviously to a certain way, the graphic novel is focused on him because we're trying to solve his murder. Right. And so we're getting insight into him. Um, but I guess story wise, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just the scenes with Dr. Manhattan, I find, are so interesting from a storytelling perspective, right? That that, and so, yeah, I would, I mean, and but of course, you know, <laughs> again, I go back and forth. I mean, you can't. How can you not like Rorschach as well? I don't know. <laughs> uh, such a great character. So I don't so know. Direct. Just, He's a direct man, that Rorschach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no shades of gray. Pick, yeah. yeah. If I had to pick one that I wanted more of, it would be Rorschach, I guess. But. uh but again, he's kind of a one-trick pony too. But I mean, yeah. he's so. This is what it is. You know, so I don't find that as interesting <laughs> as I do someone like the comedian. Where if he had lived on, you know, what is he going to do? What is you know? I don't know. So that's yeah, it's a hard question. <laughs> we say here the comedian <laughs> is essentially debate with the son about Snape uh-huh. just this morning. So we say here the comedian is essentially the captain Nixon's Captain America. So right. he, the comedian's ass is America's ass in the Watchmen <laughs> universe. <laughs> That's what we say here. You won't get any argument for me. That's <laughs> oh, man. Well, huh? Dr. Larry, it has been a pleasure. Oh, yeah, no, great. Thank you, you. Uh, thank you so, so much it. for being so generous with, uh, with uh, your time today, uh, bringing so much expertise. You know, on uh, some of our other shows, we talk a lot about the comic book medium, and, and this has been such a great such a great conversation to hear how the professional academic study end of that goes. Uh, th- thank you so, so much for bringing that to us here. And, and that, again, is something you're probably not going to get from other podcasts yeah. about. This is great. The yeah, show. Great academics. Uh, we'd love to get you back on when you've actually finished watching the series and everything. Yeah. Get your perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm going to try my best. I, uh, it's like I said, it's been on my watch list for a while, but I just haven't got around to it. But uh, I'm look, I am looking forward to seeing it. No I, 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 I'm really pleasantly surprised to see that the reviews seem to be pretty good. I was afraid it was going to bomb, and so. Well, <laughs> I mean, they definitely, it, it, they definitely. It's, it's, they fixed the problem of doing the literal stuff the movie did, right? The movie was like, we're going to literally adapt this and put it here. And the show seems to be adapting the spirit a lot better than the movie did, which is what we love. And, and also when your creator has pretty much put a curse on anything <laughs> that has been done. That's <laughs> true, yes. You pray <laughs> that your, your, your series actually could come through. But yeah, we definitely thank you for coming on here. Oh, no, girl, thank you. It's been fun. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Uh, we're back to the, the main show. Uh, Dr. Lawrence today was brought to you by nobody because we're not sponsored. Uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll drop a, uh, an ad for my own video gaming stream. Hey, guys, video games. Remember when we were kids and uh, and your your mom wanted you to go outside and stuff? Well, for a lot of us, we don't live with our moms anymore. And that means I, you can play video games uh, whenever you want. And I can do the same thing. And when I play video games, I like to stream them over on my channel on Twitch, which is the other video streaming platform, twitch.tv. My call sign over there is S-C-H-I-T-C-H. S-C-H-I-T-C-H. Check it out. You can subscribe. You can follow me. And if you want to see someone play uh, 8-bit video games like Mega Man 2 and Super Mario Brothers, head on over there. And that's the sponsor this week for our, our guest. All right. We did it. Um, before we get, uh, before we leave, coming up on the schedule, we're going to try to get something together. Now that there's enough world building, uh, Sam had this idea that I should do some more work. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of ideas that I'm Crack often doing more work. It's okay. I, I, most of my ideas are like, hey, Sam, could you re-upload this entire episode? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's fair. Um, 
but we're going to be doing a little under the tinfoil hat edition. Um, talk about speculation. It'll be a live show later in the week. We'll get some times up there. Um, also on the schedule is going to be instant react to episode four. Yep. So check that. Uh, that is going to be as soon after 10 o'clock on Sunday as we can get. Uh, for those of you that have been watching, subscribe and thank you so much. Tell your friends. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd l- love to hear more from you. Um, what do you got? What do you got? Uh, to clear us up here you got any uh, final thoughts this week sam hey it was a really good episode um uh, you know um gene smart coming on they definitely banged it out and everything um i mean i look forward to the next few episodes see how this is just gonna work out you know damon lindelof and company has just been doing a really bang up job just building this world and really making it the mystery and just you know, um, all the layers and everything just so confusing to a good, in a good way, you know, to where we're just excited to see, you know, um, um, the next episode and where it's going to go. Yep. Uh, it, it's, it's deep and rich and it's like a, you know, a chocolate cake that would take too long to bake. That's what it's uh, so nice about it's, it. It's, it's a different show. So, um, make sure that you guys are following us. Like we said, all over social media at nursecyclopedia.com. Um, uh, make sure that you are checking out our website for our blogs and, you know, extra material, um, at nursecyclopedia.com. Um, make sure that you're leaving us some feedback, not only down here, but also, um, at watching watchmen at nursecyclopedia.com. And make sure that you're following um, Scott, you know, at Steel City Hitch and follow me at Doll Pound Brown right on um, social media as well. If you don't know how to spell any of that, just click on our instant cast. Uh, we got some extra graphics on that. So yeah, that'll I have all that info awesome, for you. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right. So that's it. I mean, I, I'm done. Hey, you know, <laughs> see you, see you, see you when you see you. And make you sure that you um, leave us some feedback or... I'm going to give you the business. Peace out, guys! That I get into the situation messing with my mental. I'm thinking all the things that we've been through.